Okay, well, thank you very much. It's really an honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, and I'm going to try and tell you uh, something about some work that we've been doing, well, probably close to 10 years now. And I always have to say at the beginning of a talk like this that all of the work that I'm going to tell you about, none of it is my own. All of it is uh, work of talented uh, students, postdocs, and visitors uh, in my lab. Um, a lot of what I'll tell you about today, in fact, was uh, done by Anderson Chum, who's now a professor at Hong Kong University. Um, other stuff, Shin Yun contributed a lot. Adam Abate was a professor at UCSF, and Jeremy Agresti um, at Biorad. Uh, Lang Yin Chu from Sichuan University also. Um, and uh, Andy Utada, who's now in Japan. Um, I'm going to tell you something about microfluidics. So most of you probably have heard something about microfluidics, and you think that microfluidics, oh, it sounds like microelectronics, it's just uh, the same thing as microelectronics, but for fluids, and you're right. That's what it is. Um, and another uh, common expression for that application is lab on a chip. It's Reducing your whole lab. This is very important, I learned. It's very important in City University. <laughs> it's reducing your lab, which here is very small to begin with. It's reducing it onto the size of a chip. <laughs> so imagine if you did that. Imagine how many more faculty members you would have. <laughs> Actually, I'm not going to talk about that till the end of the talk. I will tell you a little bit about that. That is, in fact, what we spend a lot of our time worrying about. Uh, we really think about that uh, a large extent. But at the same time, we've been thinking, uh, our, we've spent a lot of our time thinking about can we make materials using microfluidics? And I would like to argue with you that in fact you can. Um, now, I want to convince you of two things. First of all, that you can make interesting materials. And secondly, that you can do it in a way that actually is commercial, that you can make it in large enough quantities. And why do I even ask something sort of stupid like that? Why would I care? Well, back when we first started this work, uh, one of my colleagues, a really wonderful colleague, uh, uh, Howard Stone, who was working at the time at Harvard and since he's moved to Princeton, he's really a, a fabulous, fabulous scientist. Uh, and a large uh, personal care company came to him and said, please, Howard, can you figure out whether we can do this commercially? Because they were interested in commercialization. And the problem, as I'll show you, is that you don't make huge amounts of quantities. I'll explain all of this why we do, do that. But Howard worked very hard for three years. And after three years, they decided, no, they can't. Of course, when I heard that, no, you can't do it, I said, that's the perfect problem for my students to work on. So I want to try and convince you that this, my students were successful. We were able to do this. And in fact, I saw yesterday uh, in the Chinese media, in fact, I saw it on WeChat, something to confirm. And I'll show this what I mean today. So um, how can we make interesting materials from microfluidics? Well, it all starts from the fact that we know how to make uh, droplets. And the nice thing about a droplet is if you think about a droplet, it's round. It's a sphere. And it's really a perfect sphere. In fact, you have to work very, very hard to change it from spherical. And the fact that it's spherical means that you can put something inside of it, but also you can use it as a template. You can use it to build new structures around it. So we, I'll show you, can make very, very uniform drops. Every one is exactly the same as the next. And we'll use each one of these drops to build something else around it, to make a more complicated structure. And I'd like to show you that these complicated structures, besides being very elegant, very interesting, very fascinating properties, are also functional. They actually do something that's useful. Um, we can learn interesting new physics. But the key to all of this is that we can control the way we make things, the way we mix the fluids, by just creating relatively simple, relatively controllable, and relatively easy to use uh, microfluidic structures to control the way we make the drops and the way we mix the fluids. So drops. Actually, you know all about drops. If you, for example, you know, there's the British tradition still in Hong Kong. So with tea, sometimes you put milk. Or if you have milk, 
Or if you make a salad dressing, milk. What's milk? Milk is white because it's got little drops of fat inside the milk. So 2% milk. Ever drink 2% milk? How, much, how many drops of fat does it have in it? 2%, right? Whole milk is 4%. Skim milk, no, no, uh, no, no fat. By the way, skim milk still looks white, but not as white as the other. So the fat particles, they're fat drops, they scatter light. And the more fat there is, the more light that's scattered, the whiter the milk looks. Heavy cream is much whiter than skim milk. Okay, so imagine now making the drops. How do you make the drops? Well, milk normally is pasteurized, and it's also homogenized. Homogenized means it's really stirred very hard to make very uniform drops. Another way of making drops, so it's an emulsion. It's a, a mixture of, of, of two immiscible fluids, oil and water, fat and water. Another one is oil and vinegar for a vinaigrette. How do you make an emulsion? How do you make drops of one fluid inside a second fluid? So Anderson asked you that question. Here he is looking at you, Professor Shum from Hong Kong University asked you that question, how do you take two fluids and mix them together? Anybody know? Very simple. Did I hear somebody say shake? <laughs> right? Shake them up. This is, whoops, this is what you get. Drops, but lots of different sizes, because you've just put this random shear, you've just brute force made lots of drops. I want to show you how to make drops that look like this. Every one exactly the same. Everyone completely identical. So how can we do it? Well, we invented a new kind of microfluidics. Again, you'll, you'll see if you follow just the theme of what I tell you about is in our group, we like to do things very simply because we like to focus on the science, focus on what we can do, and keep everything, all the experiments, as simple as we can make them. So we wanted to make some very, very simple uh, devices. So we didn't, to start with this, we didn't start with the traditional kind of microfluidic device. Rather, we started with a new kind of device that's a very, very simple device. It's based just on using capillary tubes. So we go to our friends in the biology department, particularly the ones who do patch clamping, who, who make uh, measurements of, of the um, uh, cellular potential, electric potential on cells who do patch clamping. They know how to work with these capillary devices. And we designed a new kind of microfluidic device based on them. So literally, we took capillary tubes, these are capillary tubes, these are one millimeter outer diameter, perfectly uh, cylindrical, very uniform, and they're about a half a millimeter inner diameter. Both the outer and the inner diameters are perfectly well defined, and these are very commonly used. What you do, they're glass, so you just heat them up in the middle. Heat them up and then pull them apart until they break, and you can make a very, very small orifice here. You can take something that had a half a millimeter diameter and you can make orifices if you want as thin as one micron in diameter. You can't see this here because this is taken with a camera, but I'll show you microscope images soon to do this. In fact, these are so common and so easy to make that they're machines that do this and they will perfectly reproducibly. So you just go to your friends in the biology department, you say, oh, I'll buy you a cup of coffee if you'll lend me your, your machine. You buy them a cup of coffee, and they come back, and they show you how to use the machine. It's really simple. And you can make these devices very simply. And then we want to align them. So we have to figure out, again, a very simple way to align them. And you'll see in a minute why I want to align them. I want it, but I want to do uh, something that's very simple.